I didn't have any self-confidence. I don't know if I was the first person to say this. I say I am, but maybe someone said it before me, but everyone says it now. But if you don't have self-confidence, you have to learn to keep the promises you make to yourself. Mm. And that's the foundation of building self-confidence. If you don't have self-confidence, you have a relationship and a reputation with yourself where you don't trust you. Welcome, everybody, to The Chris Harder Show, where we are making you unapologetic about your pursuit of success, knowing that when good people like you make good money, they can then do great things. My name is Chris Harder, and several times per week, I will bring you epic guests, solo episodes, and every single tool, trick, and skill set you need to grow your business, grow your money mindset, and to grow your wealth to levels that you have never reached before. I've ended up in a unique place in life where I've got the experience, the connections, and all of the secrets that it takes to be successful. And I'm lifting the curtain to reveal it all to you in an effort to help put you in a position of abundance so great that you can then be as generous as possible. So let's lock arms and let's get started. Hey, everybody, welcome back to the Chris Harder Show, where we absolutely believe that both prosperity and generosity can and must coexist. Now, this show today might be one of the best shows that we have ever, ever released to you. And I do not say that lightly. We are sitting down with the legend, Ed Milet. Now, those of you that may not know who Ed Milet is, and you'd have to work pretty hard to not know who Ed Milet is, but those of you who may not know who he is, he is the podcast host of Max Out. He is the founder of several successful companies. He is one of the most respected performance coaches in all the world. And I mean in all the world, coaching people who lead countries, coaching some of the top athletes, most famous athletes in the world, coaching some of the most famous CEOs in the world. And my favorite thing about Ed is that he is one of the kindest most genuine, bear it all, and then tell you how to fix it kind of individuals that I have ever had the privilege of getting to know. Now, not only are we going to talk about his new book coming out, The Power of One More, which, guys, this is no average book. He didn't have to write this thing. You're going to see Lori and I, because we do this interview together, literally flip out answer after answer after answer and how he relates it back to the book. And you're not, you're, you're going to want to rush out and get this thing. I can't wait to get my hands on this thing. So not only does he have the new book coming out, The Power of One More, But we ask a lot of great questions. And one of those being, what role does money play in your happiness? And I think you're going to be shocked at his answer. And right now, if you're concerned about money, and if you're hearing everyone talk about the stock market crashing or the crypto market crashing or real estate rates are higher than ever, and now mortgage payments are higher and car payments are higher and inflation is high. If you're hearing all those things and you're scared, it's okay. It's okay if you're scared, but it's not okay to not do something about it. And you can do something about it. You see, when 2008, 2009 hit, Lori and I were on the wrong side of that recession because we didn't know how to invent new income at the time. Now, fast forward 13 years, and we have perfected creating income out of our talents and our experiences and our message. And we've taken every single thing from how to think of your idea and what kind of product to turn it into and then how to deliver it and what platforms should it be on and how to accumulate audience. We have taken all of that and put it in detailed order for you in a program that we call Be Online. My favorite part about it is this. No matter who you are, no matter what your past is, at a minimum, this program can teach you how to make an extra 500 bucks a month, an extra thousand, an extra 2,000, $3,000 a month. Now, some of you, you'll take it a lot further than that. But the truth of the matter is this. When you're facing an uncertain economy coming up, nobody loses everything in recessions unless they lose their overall income. And this is a way for you to bulletproof your financial situation by inventing new income. And it's simpler than you think. Now, we were not going to release this. We spent a year building this thing last year. And we were not going to release it this year. We had too many other things going on, but we also didn't expect this recession coming this year. And so if you want our help, then all you have to do is text me the word bulletproof because we are going to make your financial situation bulletproof by helping you add new income. Text us the word bulletproof to 
310-421-0416. Again, text us the word bulletproof to 310-421-0416. That's going to give you access before everybody else to this program. And it's going to give you an investment much, much, much lower than what even early birds going to get. So seriously, you don't have to be afraid. It's in your control. As long as you invent some new income, then you can weather the storm and come out even better for it on the other end. Go ahead and text us the word bulletproof to 310-421-0416. And after you do that, get ready, listen up, take some notes, because here is one of my favorite interviews ever with my friend, Ed Milet. Ed, we are so excited to have you on our shows. You are on two shows today. We're super excited, you guys. I'm sitting here with Chris Harder, my incredible husband, and Ed Milet. And you are on the Chris Harder Show and the Earn Your Happy Show. Two for one. <laughs> two for one. So excited to be chatting with you. Thank you so much for coming on. You know what? It's so good to see the two of you. We were just talking before we started. It's been like way too long. And I'm super proud of both of you, by the way, all the great things you've been doing and achieving and the people you're helping and all that. So to get to do this together is absolutely wonderful. So thank you. That means the world. Thank you. I appreciate that. We're so grateful. And I just have to share for people who maybe have not met you personally, I got the opportunity to meet you probably, what was that, three or four years ago at 10X and got to meet you in person. And I was so freaked out because I was about to speak in front of 10,000 people. Right, I remember that. To a very, very male demographic, which I was used to speaking to all women. And I feel like you took me under your wing and I got to be on your podcast and just had the most incredible afternoon being in your energy. You calmed me down. You literally (laughs) helped me get so grounded. I honestly do not know how that would have went for me if you were not there. So I just want to share with everyone, like you are so generous with your time and just really want to see people win. And I attribute so much of how I was able to show up because of oh. you. So I'm so grateful for you. Thank you. And what's crazy about that is I have two memories of that event and it was at least four years ago. And the two memories I have of that event was one, it was a big stage and I spoke on it and I recall that and a lot of good things happened. And the second thing is of all the talks at that event was yours because mm-hmm. you were so nervous to do it. And then you crushed on my podcast, which was pretty new back then too. You crushed on my podcast, but then you really stepped into your own on your talk mm. and just owned it really big time. And I remember watching and being emotional. And I actually asked them to send me two talks back after that event. And there was probably 40 speakers in three days. And it was mine and yours. And I watched them both back mm. again because I was so impressed with how you did. That's the truth. I watched That's your incredible. talk. Incredible. Oh yeah, my gosh. Well, I'm so glad that this got recorded so I can rewatch this recording of you <laughs> saying that. It's true. <laughs> when I feel bad. Oh, Ed, like that means so much. And thank you so much. Like Chris and I truly have like such a spot in our heart for you. So we're so excited to share you with our audiences today. And I want to jump right in because you have this incredible podcast called Max Out, which is also how I initially found you. I was like, who is this guy? I'm like obsessed. I got to meet him. And now you have an incredible book out called The Power of One More which we're going to talk all about today. But I want to jump in asking, because you were not like born into success in this life that you have right now. And I would love to know what were some of the beliefs that you had growing up that you had to overcome in order to be the person that you are today? I thought I sucked. Mm -hmm. I don't know how more bluntly to put it. I didn't like myself. I had really low self-esteem. My dad was an alcoholic, which is really where the one more comes from. We'll get into that. But Mm -hmm. I really wish I could have gone back and hugged the little me. You have an alcoholic dad. You know, a lot of things happen in that house and you're ashamed of it. Mm -hmm. I couldn't have friends come over because I'd hear my dad yelling down the street. No one wanted to come over our house. If we had to go out to restaurants, I would get anxiety for hours before we had to go because I knew my dad was probably going to get into a dispute with the server, the manager, someone in there. I would leave most mornings going to school. Why can't I come from a good family? You know, what's wrong with me? And, and I had no self-esteem. Then I'd get to school. I was small, so I got bullied and really tiny. I was really thin. And so they'd, Eddie Spaghetti, your meatballs are ready. They'd tease me and then they'd go <laughs> whack me around the, the yard. And I just, there were times. Recently, I reflect, you know, you forget things. Yep. You get older, you know, when you change yourself. I now recall times where I was like, I didn't ever want to take my life, but I wondered why there was a purpose to life. I was really low. So I had to learn all the basic things of personal development or self-confidence with a lot of the things I teach just to get to baseline functioning human. 
And then when I got there, I was like, wow, I'm good at this. I could refine these things. I understand it in a way that would really support millions of people. I really believe this. Mm. And then I sort of transformed myself with the stuff that I write in the book. So I had limiting beliefs, small beliefs. I believed rich people got their money through ill-gotten means because I was told that all the time. We weren't those kinds of people. I believe that, you know, our family was just sort of cursed. All these things that I believed as a little boy, but none of them, none of them were really good. Having said that, here's the irony. I knew my parents loved me. Even though my dad was an alcoholic, I knew he loved me. And my mother was amazing. And so there was love. And that's probably been the one thing that I've built from. It's actually my fundamental belief is that all great things we do in life are from love of other people or wanting to love other people and love ourselves. So I did have that. That was my saving grace. It's interesting. You talk about growing up with insecurities. You know, we all grew up with a certain number of insecurities and a lot of them will last through adulthood. When did you feel like you had shed most of them? Was there a moment, was there a time that you can look back on and realize, okay, I finally shed those or do you still struggle with some today? Still struggle. It's one thing that probably surprises people if they see me speak or, you know, they come to our home or whatever. But I mean, you've been around me a little bit, you know, this I'm quiet Mm -hmm. and I'm introverted. And that's because still that guy's there. I'm going on the road for about a 12 day trip and uh, I'll eat in room service most of the time to this day. Same. Just so that I can be alone. Are you that way? Oh, mm-hmm. we're totally that way. We People have to force us to go down and mingle. It's that we found Me each too. other because we can both. Yeah, we it. reinforce it in each other. And that's bad. Yes, yeah, so do my wife and I. And by the way, I know that about the two of you. <laughs> I actually think there's something cool about people like us. Like we almost care more about other people's feelings than our own, which is mm-hmm. why we're sort of that way. And so we usually are givers. But I do recall moments in my life where I'm like, okay, this works. Like I actually view this situation differently. I actually believe I can do this. Mm. So I did see my confidence change. I did have mentors. Some of the strategies in the book that I've really worked on, like one thing is like I didn't have any self-confidence. I don't know if I was the first person to say this. I say I am, but maybe someone said it before me, but everyone says it now. But if you don't have self-confidence, you have to learn to keep the promises you make to yourself. Mm. And that's the foundation of building self-confidence. If you don't have self-confidence, you have a relationship and a reputation with yourself where you don't trust you. Mm. So, and I've been that person. And then I learned, okay, I'll keep these promises. I'll make my bed. I'll drink a gallon of water every day. Things I could control. I'll work out a certain time. I'll make the amount of contacts. I'll do the amount of reps in the gym that I can promise myself and I'll keep them. And I started to build baseline confidence. Mm. And then I asked myself, what could I do to become superhuman? Because in life, bold chapter in the book on goals. And it's the best goal setting chapter I've ever written or done. But still, at best, if you do what I teach you, you'll get 25% of your goals, even if they're real goals. Mm -hmm. But you'll always get the next chapter, which is your standards. You ultimately always get in life what your standards are. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, what would the standard need to be? And it's I keep the promises that I make to myself and one more. And so now, if I say I'm going to do 10 contacts a day, I keep that promise. I do the 10, but then I do one more. Mm -hmm. If I'm going to do 10 reps on the bench, I do 10 and one more. If I'm going to do 45 minutes on the treadmill, I do my 45. This is psycho. I do one more minute. Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell Bella, my daughter, I love her every day. And I started keeping that promise. Now I do it one more time a day. Mm -hmm. And you start stacking up these one mores. You just mathematically done more. But two, you transform who you believe you are. You're like, I live at a standard that's different than most other human beings. And the difference between winning and losing, you guys are proving this right now with all the stuff you have going. The difference between winning and losing in life is so small, it's almost too scary to talk about when you talk about it. And I'm like, what is that thing? And that thing is one more. That's the separator. You could do everything right in life and still lose, but if you do one more, you're gonna win. And so Mm. that's what I changed was my standard. And it was when I started doing that, Chris, that I went, I found my little recipe here. I'm not the smartest. My family, we do this every year. We do an IQ test. There's four people in my house, my wife, my daughter, my son, and I, I'm fourth in IQ. And I don't say that to be self-deprecating. I don't have a high IQ. I'm not six foot four. You know, I don't come from an amazing pedigree of winners in my family. So what was going to transform me was my standards and what I did. And so it was that stuff. What have you found? Because you've talked to so many successful people and you have these habits in your life that you do. What have you found has been like a universal truth or habit, like some key line habits of people that you have found who get what they want and reach their goals? Well, I teach them a lot of them. And so one of them is that standard. But another one, like I have a chapter in the book on time management, which is like the most tired, boring bah, topic of all time, right? Every book's like, okay, do what's urgent first over important and have a to-do list. And 
But what I teach the elite performers that I work with is how to bend and manipulate time. So I'll give you a great strategy out of the book. By the way, this book's real heavy. Like it's heavy. It may be, it might even be too heavy. Like there's a lot of tactics in there, but one of them's time. So the most antiquated is right. If I started coaching, if you run a country and I coach you, cause I'm lucky enough to coach a couple people who run big countries or did, or you're a top athlete or whatever. One of the first conversations we're going to have is about time. And I'll say, I'll let them know what I'll tell you, which is that the most antiquated, ridiculous concept on earth currently is a 24 hour day. It's stupid. It's antiquated. It's old. It's insane. And everyone's doing it because everyone does it. But the truth is, 24 hour days were outdated many years ago. This whole concept is because the sun goes around the earth or what, blah, blah, blah. Who cares? People measured days in 24 hour increments 300 years ago. There was no electricity. There were no cars. There was no phone. There was no internet. There was no smartphone. So what used to, if I wanted to write Chris a letter, I'd have to write it, find a way to write it, stick it on the back of some horse's butt. The horse would travel for a month or two and get it to him. He'd get it, read it, maybe get it, maybe write back. And then two months later, I'd hear back from him. Mm -hmm. Now I can text him and six seconds later, we've got the same message. But yeah. they were still in a 24-hour day. That's insane. Yeah. My daughter now goes, doot, 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 and her report's done for high school. I used to have to go down to a library, get out Encyclopedia Britannica's by hand, write a bunch of crap down. And then, but we manage time the same way. So the fact that you manage time the same way you did 30, 300 years ago, 50 years ago, even 10 years ago is insane. So here's how I manage time. I run many days. When you first do this, it'll feel weird. And then it won't after a while. And your life's going to transform. So my first day is from 6 a.m. to noon. That's the day. We've all had that morning where we go, I got more done this morning I have in three weeks. That should be every day. And so it would be if you did what I said. So 6 a.m. to noon's a day. And by the way, some 24-hour days, I used to just lay around and watch Netflix. And you can too. I'm not saying every day has to be crazy. But a day is not 24 hours. It's 6 a.m. to noon. And that damn get the context, the business, the life, the fun, the faith, the ecstasy, the joy, the to-do lists. And that's a day. Mm. And I'm done. And then at noon, this clock goes off now unconsciously in my head. It happens every day. I'm telling you every day. Oh, day's over. What did I get done? Accountability. Just like you do at the end of your 24-hour day. What am I grateful for? What did I get done? What do I need to double my efforts on? What did I miss? Mm. The next day starts noon to 6 p.m. Same thing. Context, business, fun, fitness laying around, whatever it might be, that's my day. And at the at 6 p.m., I'm telling you this will happen to you. The clock goes off. What did I get done? What did I miss? What do I celebrate? What did I recognize? What am I grateful for? What's left to do? What do I need to do tomorrow? And then tomorrow happens, 6 p.m. to midnight. And part of that, I sleep every time. But now I get 21 days a week. You get seven. Mm. Stack that up over a month. Stack that up over a year. Stack that up over six years. And I had thousands more days than you have in your life. Wow. I'm going to kick your tail. And the other thing that happens is the world responds to you differently because what's precious or rare is perceived valuable or scarce. That's why diamonds are worth more than paper. When your time becomes more rare, it becomes more valuable. And the mm -hmm. rest of the world starts to respond to you differently. Like you're more important. What you have to say is more important with more certainty. And so it will completely transform your life. The accountability, the measurement, the fun. People say, how have you accomplished so much in 50 years on earth when the first you grew up so insecure and shy? I got 19 strategies in the book. And one of them with every person I work with is how we bend and manipulate and perceive time. And so that's why like a lot of my meetings aren't an hour long. Most meetings don't have to be an hour. Many of them could be 22 minutes, 28 minutes. And so you, but when you got 24 hours a day, screw it. Let's do an hour long meeting. Yeah. We say 11 things in three minutes. And then we just sit around and BS for an hour. So, <laughs> so the truth. So it's, it's how I've changed my life is how I've changed time. Hmm. It's amazing. I want to stick with this idea of high performers that you work with for a minute. You mentioned people that run countries, some of the best athletes in the world, some of the biggest CEOs in the world, right? The best of the best of the best. And the subtitle of your book is the ultimate guide to happiness and success. Now, obviously, all these individuals have had massive success. How, what percentage of them would you say have achieved happiness? What a great question no one's ever asked me before. Great question. I'll give you the percentage that I think. 15%. Mm. Wow. Which I think is slightly higher than someone who has not achieved success. Yeah. Because a lot of things we do in life that make us successful rob us of our joy, mm. rob us of our happiness. We conflate the two things and think they're the same. I'll give you one with me. I have a chapter in the book called One More Emotion. And we have a series of emotions we're going to get every week. They're our emotional home. We all know this. Any given week, you're going to get these five or six emotions you're addicted to because mm. you're familiar with them. So that could be joy, peace, ecstasy, freedom, or it could be anxiety, worry, fear. 
And even if I change the external conditions, you could have a great week. You'll still find a way to wake up and go, okay, what am I worried about? Uh-huh. Okay. Uh, Lori, I know you relate to this, right? Oh, it's me. Yeah. Right. I know. And, <laughs> and it's me. And that's how I know. Mm-hmm. And so even when I change, the gut, emotions aren't negative or positive, by the way. Fear mm-hmm. is not a negative emotion. It's the dosage. If you had no fear, fear causes you to focus, mm-hmm. right? Fear causes you to prepare for an interview. Mm-hmm. So a little fear is healthy. The idea is how much of it. You get these emotions because you're familiar with them. We gravitate towards what's familiar. So for me, I did an analysis, like even five years ago, I've got good at finding peace and some, and I've got good at happiness and joy and bliss. Mm -hmm. But there's this one guy in there still called chaos. Mm -hmm. I'm addicted to chaos and it served me. It's made me successful. I'll stir things up and go for it. I'll make it happen and go for it. And it served me in success, but it's robbed me of my bliss. And the reason I'm so, I used to brag, man, I function huge under chaos. Mm. Well, yeah, you're familiar with it, dude. Well, here's why. I was an alcoholic son. Mm. There's chaos in my house every day. By the time I'm five, I'm addicted and used to chaos. Yeah. So now I'm a 45-year-old man with homes and jets and a beautiful wife and great family and unbelievable friends. And I still find a way to get me this chaos. Wow. Still find a way to get it. And so I've worked on it. Now, awareness helps something lose its power over you. Just being aware, I can go, I'm doing this chaos thing again, aren't I? Here we go. You dumbass. Here you go. Mm-hmm. But then I've got tools in the book of how to reverse that and replace it with the emotion that you want. And so, yeah, I still have some of this stuff, but man, I'm a work in progress. And I write the tools that I need in the book. So the answer, Chris, is probably 15%. Now, here's what I will say. I think after they work with me for a year, I'm telling you, I think I'm at about 70%. Wow. Mm. You know, and I do. And I think they would tell you that I haven't won with everybody. Some of them didn't come to me for happiness. They came to me for more success, but I teach them present. So I teach them gratitude. I teach them, look at what successful people have. That's different than unsuccessful people. Typically, if you want to know is they have a different relationship with pain. Mm. In other words, Napoleon Hill says with my second favorite book, think and grow rich. Mm. He says in that book that on the other side of temporary pain, if you can survive it, he says, survive the temporary, you get introduced to your other self. Mm. And in my case, that other self produces another life every time. Mm. But what we do in life is we make permanent decisions based on temporary conditions all the time. Mm. If you can survive the temporary, and I give you the tools to do it in the book, you meet these other selves. I've met hundreds of other selves of me. Successful people kind of intuitively have changed that relationship with pain where they understand it even unconsciously. I just had Phil Heath on my show, who's a seven time Mr. Olympia. And I said, Phil, why are you so successful? And you know, of course he's probably supplemented a little different than most people. Right. And he goes, you know, he gave an answer. And I said, I don't think that's what it is, bro. I think you have a different relationship with pain when you walk in the gym than an average human, you mm-hmm. chase it. You want to do leg day. You mm-hmm. want to grind through you want, cause you, I've figured out that on the other side of that pain or the, is the bigger leg, is the bigger bicep, is the more ripped back. And he goes, my God, bro, that's exactly what it is. Mm-hmm. So it's true with Phil Heath. It's true with someone who runs a country, someone who produces big wealth. They are willing to do something in the book and then I'll come up for air. I have a chapter called One More Inconvenience. Ooh. And it's building the muscle of being willing to do the inconvenient or difficult thing rather than what we're intuitively used to doing, which is to avoid. Successful people are willing to do inconvenient and difficult or hard things at a pace and more frequent nature than unsuccessful people. The problem for them is that when they get there, they're not always happy. Wow. Mm-hmm. And I help to teach them those tools. Great answer. Yeah, I would love to know when you are present in your life, when you do have joy scheduled in, when you are with your family, when you are out on your boat, when you are like having that time that you're enjoying, what would you tell somebody who is addicted to chaos or achieving or following that goal? How do you actually enjoy the downtime? How do you be present and feel like you are getting that space and that time and that recharge time? Because I feel like this is one of the hardest things for people who are addicted to anxiety and chaos and going and achieving. And for the record, I think Lori's referencing this morning, she had to get me present on our peaceful morning walk. Talking about me too, this is us. Well, okay, I'll give you a couple tools. When I come home now, my phone stays in the car the first 30 minutes before I come home. Mm. Because this sucker right here, although it's great, is a source for stress and distraction. Yep. And I am addicted to it. And so the worst thing that happened to me for a while is too many times my daughter walked in and and when she was little and I go, hang on, honey. Mm -hmm. And and I'd do this. I'd look at the phone. And then one day I caught her eyes. She came in to tell me something. Daddy, she's about six. Daddy. And I I looked in the phone. 
And I watched her, her little precious head drop. Now I've done that hundreds of times to my wife. I've done it to my mom. And what that said to my daughter was, who's ever in this phone is more important than you. And I did it repeatedly. And I just went, that's it. My kids don't need a hundred hours with me, but they need a present father when he comes home. So I put the phone down. When I'm on the boat, the phone is hidden because this thing gets me. So that's one thing that I do that's been a significant change in my life. And I feel like it's filled my, the cup of my family tremendously. The other thing is this fallacy that people believe, which is that if I'm really crushing it at work, I'm cheating my family. If I'm really busting it in the gym, work suffers. Yeah. What I have found, and I have this word in the book, I say extremity expands capacity. When you do things to the extreme, you expand your capacity to do things and other things. And so what I found, that that's not true. What I found, when I'm slaying it at work, I'm a more energized, focused, present dad. It's when yeah. I'm losing at work and stressed at work that I come home and I'm not a good dad. I find that the more fit I am, I'm a business athlete. I bring more energy. So that's an investment in my business when I'm training physically. Mm. It's an investment in my family. So there's this false belief that one takes from the other. I believe one feeds the other and extremity expands capacity. I had John Maxwell, the great leadership author on my show. He's been on twice. He's a mentor to me. He's a good guy. And I've spoken at his events. And he said to me, he goes, Ed, and he's in his 70s. I'm growing more than I've ever grown in my life right now. And that's something an older guy loves to say. Yeah, you sure are, John. You know, 78 is the new 58. You know, whatever you say, right? Mm -hmm. But the truth is he is. And he goes, mm -hmm. no, 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 I am. And he goes, let me explain. Over my life, I've expanded my capacity to grow because I forced myself to grow so much. So not only have I grown a lot, my capacity to grow from where I am is expanded. Mm. So extremity expands your capacity in life. It doesn't just make you grow. Like I have right now, my, you can tell I'm smaller than you're used to seeing me. I lost a bunch of weight on purpose just to, for a mental challenge. And one of the downsides of that is I've really trained my shoulders hard in my life and I've expanded the capacity of my shoulder socket. And now the shoulder's shrunk and it's floating around in that sucker. Oh, right? oh wow. But the truth is, that's how life is. When you really train something hard, you expand its capacity to continue to grow. So one feeds the other would be my answer. And get off that phone and be where your feet are planted on a regular basis. Mm. That's a great tip. I'm going to start practicing the 30 minute of leaving it in the car or hiding it when I first get home or at the end of our work day, or it's a much needed tool for me. So Bro, it's that. so difficult to do. And then after, <laughs> after about, by the way, after about 21 mini days of doing it, you're going to go, this is not that difficult mm. because you're managing your time differently. There's plenty of time. Why do we not want to put our phone down? I'm running out of time. I got to get this mm. stuff back. But when you start to bend and manipulate time, that affords you the space to do these things also. When you describe, when you role played, one minute, honey, one minute, babe, and you were you know, looking at your phone, I literally saw myself doing that to Lori and I saw myself doing that to my mom and I saw myself mm. doing it to other people I care about. Mm. And in the moment, it seems legit. Like, yeah. can't you see I'm in the middle of finishing my work day yeah. instead of making the priority the people that you care about and saying, hey, work day, can't you see you're over and I'm in front of the people I care about? Mm. Well, that's because you're a beautiful soul, you know, man, and then you care. And I see me doing it. I One thing I've done also, brother, I'll literally park down the street from the house before I walk in the door mm. and take 10 extra minutes and wrap those things up so I don't do it in front of them. It's good. It's just, I, mean, I don't want to send that message. By the way, same thing when you're at a lunch with somebody. Mm. You know, I put my phone down. Simon Sinek said this once. I don't even just put it flat on the table. I literally put it down where you can't see it. Yep. Nothing worse than go, just a second. Hang on. Ding, ding, ding. They're more important than you. Yep. Mm. And what's funny is you get older. There's never been anything in that phone mm. that was more important than the person I was talking to at the time. I just convinced myself it was. Mm. But yeah, nothing true. in there was actually more important at any given time of my life. Mm. So it's crazy that we keep doing it over and over when we prove it's not true. God, that's mm -hmm. so spot on, right? There's always going to be more business deals. There's always going to be more business yeah. partners. There's always going to be more customers. But in theory, there shouldn't be more wives or more husbands. There shouldn't be yeah. more children, right? Like you only get a few of these precious people. So yeah, the other great thing flip of the priorities here. Yeah, and one other little tip I would just say is show me your schedule and you'll show me your priorities. Mm -hmm. So for the first 20 years of my life, too many times, you guys, I'm just going to say this to you, I'm going to be bare my soul. There's too many times even now where Christiana will say to me, my wife, do you remember when Bella, I don't remember, babe. Ooh. She goes, but you were actually there. And I'll go, no, nah, maybe I wasn't there then. Mm. And there's been too many times in my life where I wasn't present where I was. And so what I used to do, bro, is I would schedule my business life first and then fit my family and my relationships in the holes. This is what mm. most people do. 
So what would go first, babe? I got to move the date night because this speech came up, babe. Then I switched about maybe 15 years ago where I went, my family is first in my calendar and then everything else is scheduled around that. Love that. So just that priority shift in my life. You go, well, that's easy to do when you're rich. No, no, no. I'm talking about when I was becoming rich, Mm -hmm. I was doing this because these things enrich one another. Mm. And so now I schedule everything around them, not where I fill them in. What are some things that you have scheduled in for yourself that you feel feed everything else that you're doing outside of working out and taking care of yourself? But like, what do you do for joy that you put into your schedule that you feel like feeds everything else and why? I love comedy clubs. So I I go to a lot of comedy clubs now that COVID's over. I've been at like 11 concerts. I just went to Stagecoach. I just saw Pearl Mm -hmm. Jam play. I'm going to see my buddy, Brett Eldridge play. Brett Eldridge play. I'm going to see uh, Chili Peppers play. Like Mm -hmm. I'm a big comedy guy. They've all been on my show. They're friends of mine and I love music. So, but I have a chapter in the book called One More Level of Equanimity. And equanimity is calmness and peace under duress. It's a very unique word. I teach it to a lot of my athletes, like UFC guys that I work with. When things speed up in fights, they speed up. Mm. And when things speed up is when they get knocked out. So I try to get them to slow things down to what I call matrix time or bullet time. We can talk about that in a minute and get more equanimity or peace. So what I do is I do meditate and I've now done walking meditations. I control my breathing. My word for this year is peace. I want more equanimity and peace in my life. Tom Brady comes up to a line of scrimmage under pressure and it's 80,000 people. There's a minute and a half left in the game. Brady finds equanimity in those moments. The rookie quarterback speeds things up. Wow. So Brady will get under center and things slow down. He goes into matrix time. The whole second chapter is called the matrix. I should tell you about it, but mm-hmm. and he can now what he's doing is his reticular activating system scans the defense and finds the hole in it. And when the ball, all is snapped. He can audible or he'll snap. His RAS finds the open wide receiver. The rookie quarterback, it speeds up. And when he comes back, his RAS finds the covered receivers, not the open ones. Mm-hmm. And so Brady can find equanimity under duress. Good friend of mine's Michael Chandler. He's a UFC fighter. He fought last weekend. He had lost two fights in a row. He was winning both of those fights. And then he would get hit. And when he got hit, he went into raw mode. Lack of equanimity. Mm-hmm. He ended up losing. This last weekend, it happened again. He gets clocked, eye swells, whoa. And you watch him start to speed up. And then he went, wait a minute, I'm going to step back and I'm going to get equanimity. He found it. Listen to this. The next round he comes out and he knocks this guy out with one of the most devastating leg kicks in the history of the USC. He knocked this man out cold for three minutes Mm. and he wins the fight. Let me tell you what's nuts. He gets interviewed afterwards and he says, I've never practiced that kick in my life. Wow. But things slowed down and I saw the opening and I responded. That's how life works. When we can Mm -hmm. get equanimity and slow things down, we find parts of ourselves and our ability to respond and react in life. that's completely different than when it speeds up. Mm. And so peace and equanimity don't just serve our hearts. It's actually a peak performance strategy Mm -hmm. and it helps us recover. So for me, it's peace, it's meditation, it's laughter, it's music. So I want to know more about Matrix Time because... I think people listening are like, that sounds great. I would love to figure that out. But what happens when you're actually viscerally experiencing anxiety or panic or, you know, going out on stage or doing things new in business when you have to make those new contacts, those phone calls getting rejected? How do we find that equanimity within those moments? Are there things to like practice? 100%. So there's a part of your brain called the reticular activating system. It's right there in the prefrontal cortex. And it's the filter that reveals the whole world to you. What's most important to you. And it's powerful as heck. You see things that reinforce your beliefs, hear things that do, and it draws to you, but it filters stuff out. So you don't feel like the blood in your right ear right now, right? Because otherwise you'd go crazy. So it keeps you sane. So if you are obsessed with your anxiety or your fear or your worry, your RAS is constantly delivering to you Mm. evidence of this issue all the time. I'll give you an example of how it works and how easy it is to fix. And this has changed my life. So in the matrix, things slow down, right? And your RAS is your matrix. It reveals to you what's real. Mm. You're choosing a reality. This is a fact. This isn't rah-rah. And so I just bought a Tesla. I like what Musk is doing. I have no idea whether he's really buying Tesla or Twitter or not. I don't care. I just like the moves this cat's making, right? (laughs) So I bought a Tesla. I told my team, I said, give me a Tesla. Next day, Tesla's here, which is cool to to the abundance to do that. The Tesla shows up and I'm driving this Tesla now and I'm driving Christiana crazy. I'm like, babe, red Tesla. All of a sudden I see him everywhere. White Tesla. Green Tesla, 
babe, three lanes over, other side of the 55 freeway the other day. I'm like, babe, black Tesla plaid. She's like, you're crazy. Why are you seeing these everywhere? You ever have that experience when you buy a new car or something? And I go, babe, they were always there. They just weren't important to me before. So I never saw them. Now I see them everywhere. When you walk into a room and it's loud and not even audibly very loud, someone says your own name, you hear it. Ed, Mm -hmm. Lori, Chris, you're like, what? Over the other noises. That's your RAS using its auditory skills. The key thing in your life is for the Teslas of your life to be your visions, to be your dreams, to be your goals, to be the, the theory of the power of one more is this. You're much closer to your dream than you think. Mm -hmm. The Bible says where there's no vision, the people will perish. Mm -hmm. I think if you dig deeper, we have vision. You want to be happy or sad? What's your vision? Happy. Help people or not help people? Help people. Rich or poor? Probably rich, right? Great friendships, no friendships. You want great friendships. Mm -hmm. So you have a vision. The issue is you want millions of dollars? You probably do. You think it's further away than it is. Mm. Because you think it's so far away, your RAS reveals to you the per- people, places, and circumstances that prove you to be right. Mm. And you perpetually keep it there. But what if the truth is you're one decision away from changing your life? One relationship, one meeting, one thought, one new emotion, a podcast, one book away from changing your life. Now, if you believe that, your RAS makes that your Teslas. Mm-hmm. And the way you do it, if I'm going to just go deep, yeah. is through mm-hmm. repeated, very simple visualizations that I teach you in the book that an eight-year-old can do. They're very simple. But what happens is you start to make your mind familiar with these things, and it goes out to hear and find the references to prove you're right. If you do this, in six months, you're going to go, you're not going to believe this. Totally coincidental. I'm at a coffee shop. Guy behind me is talking about the product that we have that I need. You're not mm-hmm. going to imagine this. You can't even believe it. I met this person. I saw this thing. I heard this conversation. It's not coincidental at all. It's your RAS revealing to you that which most important to you. You already do this, except you do it habitually with your worries, your fears, and your anxieties. And so you move towards those. Mm -hmm. And if you're not careful, you're going to repeat the same life over and over and over again with just different cast of characters, with different circumstances that deliver you the same emotions. Mm -hmm. And so when we program this, we change our lives literally. We change our reality literally when we do this. And great people are great at this. And average and ordinary people are too. They're just getting more of what they don't want instead of what they do want. Mm-hmm. You had just referenced money and wealth a few times in, in that answer, right? Mm-hmm. Elon is able to just buy Twitter and, and sure. change things. I buy his Tesla, he buys Twitter. Right? Exactly, yeah, right? Sure. And you're able to just go out and hey, get me a Tesla and all right. these things. And then when you're giving the example, rich or poor, hey, you probably choose rich. The average person listening to these podcasts right now probably yep. makes fifty to $150,000 a year. Yep. And they probably have just a couple of months of runway ahead of them before they would have to you know, do something to make ends meet. Mm-hmm. You obviously are light years ahead in the wealth game. Hundreds and hundreds of millions, if not billions, who who knows? And the question is, what level, is there a sweet spot? Is there a moment where X number of dollars helps to really make somebody happier, really helps to bring them a better life? I think there's a dollar amount, bro. I do think that there's a breathing room amount. Mm -hmm. But like, I don't think success is, and I don't mean this, I don't think everybody listening to this does want a ton of money. I think success in life is where your blueprint of your life or your vision for it matches the reality you've created. That's success to me. So when I work with people, what do you really want? By the way, it's often an emotion. I always want to say this to you. It's often an emotion, meaning, listen, we don't want the jet. We want how we think the jet's going to make us feel. We don't want the island I just bought. It's how you think the island will make you feel. You you don't even want the relationship. It's how you think the relationship will make you feel. Mm -hmm. And we've had this conflated thing in society where we chase things, which is healthy. But what if you started to pursue the emotions first? Mm -hmm. I want the peace. I want the ecstasy. I want the joy. I want the passion. If you pursued both simultaneously, you'll be much more likely to get the things than you will if you don't. And so I teach a lot of the people I teach to do that. I have a sister, man. She's blind. My middle sister, Andrea is blind. She was born with diabetes and she lost her vision. And so she can't drive. She can see some shadows, but she can't drive. She's one of the most successful human beings I've ever met in my life. My beautiful Mm -hmm. sister. And she makes $38,000 a year. She's a fourth grade school teacher at a Christian school. She's doing exactly what her gifts call her to do. Mm -hmm. She's doing exactly what she wants with her life. And it takes advantage of her gifts. She's kind. She's gentle. She's nurturing. She's an incredible teacher. Mm. She's 4'11". 
Mm -hmm. So she's the same height as all of her students. Mm -hmm. Because she's blind, she has no judgment of people. Oh, Mm -hmm. wow. And she's as successful as I am, if not more, because her blueprint of her life is matching her vision. That's good. Mm -hmm. And her life is the reality of it. And so she's got the emotion she wants on a regular basis. She's successful. And I'm very proud of her. I got to share something with you that I've not shared anywhere. And this is, a, I just want to add this because I love you guys. And it just, I want to share it with the two of you. Mm. There's a lot of people in life like my sister who discount themselves and think this deficiency I have mm. disqualifies me from being happy or successful. This thing I'm ashamed of that you don't know about, this divorce I've had, this bankruptcy, this business failure, this lack of success in my history disqualifies me. Mm-hmm. And the most important decisions that changed my life was made by my dad when he got sober. It changed my entire life. It altered my, my life forever. And it, my grandchildren will be grateful for that someday. My wife is. Millions of people that I help. I'm talking to you, bro, and Lori, because I, my dad made that decision. Mm-hmm. And I've always credited, I wrote a whole book about it called The Power of One More and all the stuff that I learned. Three weeks ago, I wake up and I've known my wife since elementary school, so she knows me pretty well. And I said, babe, you need to wake up. And I was crying. Mm. I said, honey, something just occurred to me that I haven't thought of for 50 years of my life. She's like, what? Someone helped daddy. Wow. What, babe? I said, someone helped oh my, my dad. Gosh. Someone helped my dad. In the yeah. My dad was going to lose his family. In the darkest moment, my dad's the most ashamed on his knees in his life. Some precious soul helped my dad change his wow. life. Mm-hmm. And I don't know who they are. And they changed everything for me. Wow. And you and our kids, and millions of people I reach. She goes, oh my God, and she's crying. And I said, it gets better. What qualified this person to help my dad yep. wow. was the things they were the most ashamed of. Yeah, They were a drug addict. They were an alcoholic. Little did they know God was using them and preparing them when they were stealing from their family and lying and in bars and doing things that they would never want people to know. The most shameful things of their life was qualifying them to help my dad change his life and help me. Babe, is that not beautiful how the universe uses people? God uses people to change you. And these are the very things most people listen to this go, that disqualifies me. You don't know, man, I'm divorced. I've had this business setback. I haven't had the courage to start a business. I have this stuff I'm totally embarrassed or ashamed of. I'm blind. I'm this. Those are the things that qualify you. It's amazing. The very thing that you think disqualifies you is the very thing preparing you. This old adage of your test becomes your testimony is a truth. I'm living proof of it. And so this person, this precious soul in my dad's darkest moment of his life took the things that were the darkest about them and changed my family forever. And so when I say, I know you can change people's lives. I know you were born to do something great with your life. I know that God does not call the qualified. He qualifies the called. Mm. That I'm telling you that these things you keep thinking aren't great about you are the very things qualifying you because we're not in a culture anymore where perfection sells. Mm. Why do I remember Lori so much? Why do I remember Chris so much? Because Lori was so vulnerable with me. Mm. And in the interview about her upbringing and the things that hurt her, And what happens is you start rooting for this beautiful woman, this beautiful couple. You start rooting for them. And it's where I connect with her because I relate to that. Mm -hmm. So these things you think that disqualify you are your very qualifications. And I hope everybody remembers that. And that's not in my book. It happened after Mm -hmm. I wrote the book, but I felt like I wanted to share it with the two of you. That is so so impactful. Like that just, yeah, it just opened up my whole life and just seeing so many people Mm -hmm who, yeah, who we haven't gotten to see or know who have impacted our lives. Like that is, it makes it so real why it's so important for us to go for our vision or to show up for our purpose. So I think that brings me to the question, like, Ed, why do you think that people listening, like maybe they just woke up like, oh my gosh, these things qualify me. Like I could do this. Why do you think it's important for people to show up for their purpose, like to chase that next evolution of themselves. What have you seen happen if people don't do that? Well, what I have seen that does happen is you will feel at home for the first time in your life if you've never felt that way. Mm. Like you and I doing this work right now, the three of us, like this isn't work, we get to do this. Mm -hmm. And it's so beautiful to think I've turned my pain into something really powerful. And I'm actually oddly grateful for it now. I'm proud of me. Mm. I'm proud of you you guys. It takes courage to say, hey, listen, I'm not perfect, but I mean, I intend to serve you. I had something really powerful happen. God's been so good to me. 
So, you know, I knew Tony Robbins really young and Tony gets, you know, people know that we've known each other a long time. My dad was my main mentor. I'll share one more story with you that'll help everyone do this. I'm 28 years old and I won my first incentive trip when this financial comes in to go to Hawaii. And I, we're staying at the Ritz Carlton Kapalua. Mm. And my wife and I are, we're newly married. We haven't been married very long. I have no money. And we get in this place, we go down to have lunch right when we check in. It's like a $28 hamburger in like 1993 or something. Yeah, I, go, yeah. I go, babe, I go, let me just tell you, I've done some math. We are out of money Tuesday. <laughs> so, like, so we literally go to the grocery store in Maui and I'm walking through the lobby of the Ritz Carlton with like grocery bags to my room because we're eating peanut butter and jelly. I said, babe, we get two meals here. Pick a dinner and pick a buffet for breakfast because that's what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened. So I remember that on the trip. And the other thing I remember is I got up early to work out like I always do before the sun's up and you get rewarded to beat the sun up and I'm running down the beach coming at me is this hairy bald guy with like a hairy back sweating I can't see him very well because it's dark it's really dark out and he gets nearer to me and it's Wayne Dyer oh, wow. and those of you that may not know who Wayne Dyer is you can google him but he's one of the most beautiful thought mm -hmm. leaders in the history of thought leaders and this remarkable man he does mm -hmm. the work that the three of us do and he was doing it way before we were probably even born mm -hmm. and he runs by me and I go, Dr. Dyer, I had a Sony Walkman on. That's how old I am. <laughs> he had one on. I'm playing a cassette. And I go, Dr. Dyer, you changed my life. Because mm. I've had lots of people say that to me. So have you, right? Yep. And he turns, he has a deep voice like me. He goes, I doubt that. Wow. You probably changed your life. But how wow. did I help you? And he walks towards me. And guys, for the next 90 minutes, I sit on the beach and I watch the sun come up with Wayne Dyer. Wow. And he, and he became a lifelong friend. And we talk for an hour and a half. And in about an hour and 20 minutes, then he goes, Ed, and he looks at me, he goes, you're going to change the world. Ugh. And maybe he had said that to other people. But for me, this was Wayne Dyer on yeah. the beach telling me I'm changing the world. And he goes, I think you're brilliant. And the way you articulate points and communicate, I've never, he goes, I don't know what planet you're from, but I'm pretty sure it's not this one. That's literally what he said to me. And he goes, and my friend, that's not why. And he goes, would you do me a huge favor? Would you never again in your life attach your, self, your, attach your self worth or your value to your abilities or your achievements? And he goes, Ed, that's going to be really hard for you because you got a lot of abilities and you're going to have a lot of achievements. Mm. And if you make that mistake, you'll be chasing that all your life to find happiness. You'll have success, but you won't have happiness. And he said, and the other thing is when they break and they will, so will you. Wow. And I said, so what do I do? Mm. He said, Ed, you're going to change the world. Everyone listen, because this applies to you listening or watching. Your intentions are incredible. And he said, Ed, the most powerful thing in the world is our intentions. And you intend to make a difference. You intend to serve people. I feel your heart. That was the first time anyone had ever complimented me in my life where I believed it. I've never believed I was talented. I've never believed I was smart. Chris, you asked earlier if that guy's still there. He's there right now. You told me I'm amazing. I wish I could believe you, but I don't but you tell me I have a heart to serve people and I want to help people. I know that stuff's true. Mm -hmm. And so I have held my self-esteem, my confidence, my belief in myself comes solely from my intentions. Right before we did this today, right before we did, I was on another show. I grabbed about one minute. I said a quick prayer and I said, I reminded me of my intentions. I've done that probably 400,000 times in my life since Dr. Dyer told me this. Wow. I say this to everybody because this is what you all need to begin to attach your confidence in, not your ability to get every question right. But if you combine this experience you've had in your life and you shift and give yourself the confidence that my intention is to contribute, my intention is to make a difference. Now you'll have something within you that gives you the guts to step forward and do it. It's not enough just to have the experience and have the knowing, okay, this does qualify me. Where do I get the strength from to do it? You're not going to be on your ability. It's not going to be on your belief in yourself. We'll be sitting here for 40 years. But if it's based on intent, you could do it right now. I intend to make a difference. I intend to help this person. I intend to be happier. I intend to help them become happier. I'm pretty sure that person who helped my dad didn't have super high self-esteem. I think they went, I intend to help this man. Wow. And they made a step based on intent. Man, intentions driven. What I didn't know is Dr. Dyer was writing a book at that time called The Power of Intention. Yeah. Wow. And it's a great wow. book, mm -hmm. but it altered my life. And I got to tell you, I've, I've reminded of myself of that. I did it again before we started today. And I'll probably do it again at some point this weekend when I speak. I do it often. I do it when I have to go have a hard conversation with my daughter. I intend to love this little girl and help her get better. Mm. I do it when I have to have a hard conversation with my wife. I do it every time I'm afraid. Mm. When I'm afraid, which is often. When I'm afraid, I remind myself of my intent and it gives me great comfort combined with my faith. 
Mm. It gives me great comfort. You made me just drop in and, and have such a massive realization, like, all of the things in my life that I have started were started because of an intention. Mm -hmm. And then when the plan comes in or the strategy comes in, it's so easy to get out of that and get into the doing mm -hmm. and lose like even recently on some of the things I'm working on. I'm like, okay, how do I get back into that? And that word just like literally yeah. like a lightning bolt, like got me right back into, mm -hmm. oh, that's the word that's going to anchor me mm -hmm. to what, me too, Lori. I, the process of stuff, even like having a book, it's like, okay, I've got this show. I got this interview. I'm doing this. It's like, wait a minute. What's my intention with doing yeah. this? I get to do this. I don't have to do this. Yeah. I get to do it because it's my intention. And man, do I have a lot of confidence in that part of me. I had a lot of confidence in that part of me. Abilities, smarts, talent, not so much. That, I've known that since I was born. And so yeah. is everybody listening to this. It's funny. We're going to tell everybody where to get the book in a minute, but uh, last closing question for you here. Cause I want to make sure we respect your time. You just talked about, you said a quick prayer before the interview. It's funny. I did the same thing. I say it before mm -hmm. I speak on stage or before I do interviews, I know Lori does the same thing. Mm -hmm. Tell us how does the power of one more play into your faith? Yeah. I wrote a chapter. I have the one more level. Well, I call it one more prayer. It's the hardest. I probably took longer to write that chapter, Chris, than the whole book. Wow. Cause I didn't want to offend my good friend, Earl McManus, who's a pastor. He goes, oftentimes, religion or Christianity even gets in the way of people getting to know Jesus. We're both Christians. And so I don't like at all the judgment often that comes with any organized religions. Yeah. It hurts my soul when I see it. Mm. And so I really admire and respect anybody that holds a belief true to them that they serve. For example, my father used a spiritual belief system that's not the same as mine to change our family forever. Yeah. And so I have great admiration and respect for that. And my dad, we would do, talk about faith and our faiths were slightly different, actually, maybe even more than slightly. And so I don't want to ever be disrespectful to anybody who has any faith at all, because I admire it. I'm also really interesting because I am a Christian, but I'm a huge believer in the quantum field and energy and vibration and frequency. And I'm, we're feeling an energy right now. That's beautiful to, to say that there's not energy that we don't respond to energy is insane. And so I've, I believe there's this vibrational frequency that when you're really cooking like we are right now, man, stuff comes out and it takes over. And, and so I couldn't write a book about being happy and successful. That's true to me if I didn't acknowledge my faith. Mm -hmm. And so I try to do it in the most respectful and tactful way possible. But my faith has given me comfort. It's given me strength. When my kids were born, I remember feeling a love for each of them that is inexplicable, inexpressible. Mm -hmm. I mean, if my daughter killed somebody, I'd help her hide the damn body. Man, isn't that crazy? Like you love someone that, and if she did, I always tell them when they go before, I go, babe, whether you hit a home run today or you don't, daddy can't love you any more or any less. It's mm -hmm. impossible. It's an unconditional love. There's no mm -hmm. conditions on it. And then to think that there's a God in heaven who loves me even more than that is a great comfort to someone like me. And so many times in my life, I have all these really detailed, heavy technical strategies, but here's the truth. There's a bunch of times in my life, I can't explain it. Yeah. I can't explain it. It's a blur. And my only conclusion is that something bigger and better than me was helping me during those mm. times. My version of bigger and better that's revealed itself to me happens to be my faith. Whatever yours is, I admire. But to go through life without any faith, I think is a sad way to go through life. And I would encourage you that if it's on your heart to pursue what's true for you. I think there's a conversation going in the back of all of our minds. I'll share this with you last. If you want to know the power of one more in your life, it's when I take it from you. I was with my dad when he passed. I was mm -hmm. holding my father's hand. And my dad got cancer eight years before, guys. I'll tell you this real quickly. And when he got it originally, he goes, look, man, here's the deal. I'll fight this thing once, but I'm not going through eight years of stuff where I embarrass myself in front of my family and make you all feel bad for me. So I'll do it once. That led to eight years of chemo, surgery, radiation, chemo, proton therapy, radiation, surgery, chemo, radiation, new chemo, experimental chemo, radiation. And I would say to my dad through those years when he was really just shrinking and suffering and throwing up and would never complain and losing weight and dad, why are you doing this? And he goes, well, if I keep fighting this thing, maybe I'll see one more of my granddaughters get married. Oh. Wow. Maybe I'll get to go to one more Christmas play for my grandson. Maybe I'll watch him hit one more home run. Maybe I'll see old Max play one more golf mm -hmm. tournament. And he goes, Eddie, when you're faced with never having any one mores, man, they become very valuable to you. Mm. Wow. 
And then when he died, I was holding his hand. And my favorite thing with my my life was to play golf with my dad. Mm-hmm. And neither one of us are any good. You know, we're not, we're not pro golfers. Mm-hmm. It was five hours with my best friend. Yeah. And we would sit a foot from each other and talk about faith, mm-hmm. talk about life and politics, which we also disagreed on, you know. <laughs> do you know what I would do, you guys, to have one more round of golf with my dad? Mm-hmm. Oh, my God. Yeah. Mm. what I would give you for one more round of golf with my dad. And I would just say to so many people, listeners, if you want to know the power of one more, what if I told you with the person you love the most that you get one more dance with them? Mm-hmm. If you have someone you love and I said, you only get to get to talk to them one more time, how much more precious would that conversation be? Right. Mm-hmm. How much more precious is that person in that moment become to answer your question earlier? How much more present would you be? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that one more, the power of it is when I take it from you, yeah. mm-hmm. the good news is if you have lost somebody in your life, honor them with who you become. Mm-hmm. But if they're still here, take advantage of that one more. What if you started to look at like this next meeting you have What if this was my last meeting, mm-hmm. how would I handle it? And so I've really learned to make things in my life powerful by knowing I may only have one more of them. And so that's just changed my life. And I wanted to share that with you at the end, just because I believe it could change other people's Mm -hmm. lives. Start to treat people like, wow, I can tell you, honestly, my wife was just getting dressed. She's going to the mall with my kids. And I think my wife's smoking hot. (laughs) We've been together for 132 years. So, (laughs) and I walked in and I looked at her and I walked out because I had some stuff. And as I walked out, I'm not kidding you, Lori. I went, what if that was the last time I get to look at her? Mm. This just happened an hour and a half ago. Mm-hmm. And I turned back around and I went in and I stood in the doorway of the closet <laughs> and I looked at her for a minute and I go, babe, you are so beautiful. And something happens in your heart when you almost get out of your life for a minute and look at it, like, what if this was the last time I get to see this precious mm-hmm. woman? I love her so much. Mm-hmm. I love her so much. Mm-hmm. And I gave myself the gift of feeling it mm-hmm. by thinking if it was only one more time. And it was a more beautiful moment than it was five minutes before when I had a million of them left. And so it's just one way to look at your life. And that's why I wrote the book. It's mm. amazing. And I want to acknowledge you. I know you have to go, but I want to acknowledge you saying most people write books because they want to get their message out. Most people write books because it might be an income source. Most people write books for significance. You didn't need any of those things. You wrote the power of one more because this is clearly, as we've heard over the past hour, something that means the absolute world to you to get this important message out there to people. So everybody rush out there, grab the power of one more. It's available June 1st, Amazon or anywhere else that books are are sold. And I just want to acknowledge you and and, and let you know how grateful we are that you took the time to write this. I love both of you. I got to see you in person next, but thank you for the time. And God bless everybody. Thank you. Oh my gosh. We're so grateful for you. We're going to do something with your book in just one second, but I just have to say, I don't think I've ever held back tears the almost the entire half of a podcast ever in the 900 episodes I've done. This is so impactful. I'm so grateful for you. Thank you for your time. And thank you for being so present with us. Like you were so dropped in and seriously channeled half of that. So I'm so grateful to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. You can get the book right now. And if you don't like it, I'll give you your money back. Just DM me and I'll send you some money. Go get it right there. And, and and I'll tell you what, we're the first 50 people that tag you, Lori, and I with this episode on one of their takeaways or one of their breakthroughs, Lori and I will personally buy and send them a book. So on Instagram, tag Ed, Lori, and I with your biggest takeaway. The first 50 of you, Lori and I will personally buy and send you a book. Ed, thank you so much. We're grateful for you. I love you guys. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks for listening. And if you loved this episode and know of someone else who is as successful as they are generous, please pass them on to me. It would mean the world to me if you help me get this cause and this message out to as many listeners as I can. So please, if you liked what you heard, it goes a long way if you take 30 seconds and leave me a five-star review and share this with your friends. I'll be forever grateful. And until the next episode, cheers to your success. 